with my role at University of Technology in Sydney, I think it's very much CISO is leader of the cybersecurity strategy, program, plan, um, embedding that alignment with the rest of the of how the university works with risk and understanding of risk. But in terms, you know, to your point of leader helping sort of the, I guess the senior executives of the university lead and and other people within the organization lead. <laughs> it's very much, I guess, enabling awareness raising trying to facilitate some training, you know, whether that's direct sessions with them or asking them to to do this, that or the other in order to set that tone. Um, I mean, I think, I guess, luckily at UTS, I've been here three years now, that there's been two vice chancellors, but but they've both been very keen on, on cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. So there's been no opposition in, in terms of why it's relevant or, or anything like like that. It depends what you want access for. I have no problem. Like if there's a message I need to send, I can I can send it or speak to people. That's no problem. The the more challenging it is, they getting two hours of a very senior group's time to deliver training or awareness or a very focused session mm-hmm. on cybersecurity. That is trickier, just because I guess in in all organisations, maybe particularly universities, th- there's simply so many governance forums. They're so yeah. busy. Um, so to get a dedicated two hours is really hard. Yes. Um, but that said, you know, we we have, you know, the, the chief operating officer is also extremely supportive and, and I sort of ultimately report up into his his line for the operations division. You know, we do emergency management training sessions. We, we have all of that side of it running fairly well. The much yeah. bigger struggle is that general messaging or general change of behavior, how to really get into the faculties, how to how to nudge people enough yeah. just to change yeah. those little things in their daily life that that's not a nuisance you know we've rolled out multi-factor authentication that went really pretty well that you get some opposition I think you always do from from somewhere but that was generally accepted and I think in general in society people are are more used to that sort of behavior now yeah. but it's things like care with documents we're now challenging how do you really get each individual to classify the document to the right level to be yeah, very yeah, careful yeah, yeah. who you you send it to and within team we use microsoft you know within that teams um or sharepoint environment yeah i mean that's one of the the aspects and you know it's a joint there's also a chief data officer um at uts and you know it is a joint effort but that's certainly one of the big challenges maybe again particularly for universities we have to have such an open environment so you can't yeah. lock data down you can't lock your perimeter like there is no data perimeter I don't know if that exists anywhere anymore but we have so much external collaboration with research or with um uh, you know we have to send information to so many other agencies so it's those sorts of challenges and that's just a particular one where we're tackling right now but 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 I guess what I'm trying to say is it's just so many different layers of leadership in different areas and to get the sort of more tailored there's some very general messages you can get out you can have very strong messaging from the top, you know, do your training, this is important. And, mm. and you know, for example, the vice chancellor modeled traveling in a safer way with burner devices and things like that, which is also something we've only recently been able to introduce. But it's that, how do you get it across to every single person um, mm. that need to be a bit more careful, but also to the relevant managers. And so, so it gets more, um, it's a bit slightly fragmented, but, but, we're trying to work a bit more on the more the, the tailored end of the leadership and messaging, I guess. And I think the way I asked <laughs> a rather unfair question now, I think the question should have been, what are the metrics that give you uh, hope or confidence that you're making traction? Because obviously you're not going to get a perfect world. What What's the way, what are the things that show progress? Metrics are are harder on that front on awareness. I think awareness and metrics or engagement or behavior is, is very difficult one. Um, so one, I guess one is a very qualitative, I guess, measure is simply more people talking about cybersecurity, more people coming to the cybersecurity team to ask questions. Um, I, I hear other people raising the issues. It doesn't have to be me. You know, that in itself, you know, signifies a culture change that the people are getting the message. People are taking responsibility, um, you know, sort of unprompted. They'll raise something around whether it's data or multi-factor authentication or access, you know, access controls, things like that. So, so 
the, the message is being spread. Um, and then we we use at the moment, you know, what we're still using more sort of capability maturity scores um, for overall capability measurement. So like the NIST yeah. Group framework and then get it. We're honing in on, you know, more specific measures around particular assets and, and things like that. So so metrics are a bit challenging trying to find ones that are really meaningful um yeah. but we do fishing simulations we do training we, we obviously we, we look at the metrics around that as well what i hear what i hear there uh, anna it's almost a hygiene so you're actually mm, talking about building from a hygiene level <clears throat> and enhancing and improving that level but getting some of the basic foundations in place yeah and then making people see that and i think certainly and i, I think it's fairly common message probably, but in the UK, so I was with the British government for a long time, and you know, the very strong message there was top 10, like, I, I forget the exact, you know, statistics they use, but something like, you know, 90% of cyber attacks can be stopped if you get these controls right, yeah. and, you know, ASD has picked up some of that, that language as well, but to do it at a slightly bigger level, the problem is, of course, things like multi-factor authentication, as soon as you put them in, you know, now it is a basic control, the attackers just start targeting that. So, so it is this continual spiral, but still it's something you need to have in place and it can give a certain amount of assurance when you do um, as patching can and some of the network, you know, um, issues, sort of segmentation and segregation, th things like that. So some of it is actually quite simple to talk about. It's just yeah. very hard to do. Um, I found it really interesting with the WannaCry, you know, that global WannaCry attack yeah. in 2017, which I think really was the first major sort of global cyber attack that woke everyone up, I think, to to how some of this malicious um, viral malware could work. Um, and what came out of that was how hard patching is to do in most organisations, Yeah, particularly yeah. if you have, and then with NotPetya, that operational technology side as well. So it's sort of really... So those basics of, well, operational technology is now connected. Um, patching is an absolute necessity, but it's really, really hard to do, um, certainly in some some scenarios more than others. And those basics, though, you know, you, you keep hearing the basics talked about. They're very boring, often, very, yeah. very boring. Yeah. So they're much harder <laughs> to communicate in an exciting way to people. <laughs>